Father, we thank you for your love and your mercies. We thank you that we're able to come together again. We pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds that we can understand what you started in the Reformation and what you expect us to finish. Bless us as we continue to hear your voice. May we follow. May we understand our part. Guide us today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We uh, talked about a law. The law of something small. <laughs> that God does things with small things. He doesn't use the big and the mighty of the world because they'll think they're doing it. He always starts small. He starts with a seed and makes a big tree. And we're going to see that in history he does the same thing. He uses small things to do his purposes. We can look at history, for example, and we uh, think about Zwingli, for example. Where did he come from? He was part of the household of a shepherd's hut. <laughs> he was not rich. He was not big. He was a shepherd's hut. That's where he came out of. We have Melanchthon who was the major theologian of the whole Reformation. He came from an armorer's shop. And Luther himself came from a, a poor miner's family. And so we see God, He dips into the common people. Not the most ignorant, obviously, but the common people. Not the rich ones, not even the middle class, but just people. To show that it's His work. He's the one that's doing it. And that's part of the reason we're going through this. We want to understand how God does things. Each of us began our life in a certain way. We learned certain things. And we really didn't have a lot of choice about that. The, the home we were born into, the environment we were in, all these kinds of things. But that early education that we had stays with us our whole life. Yeah. And some of us have more to overcome than others. <laughs> because of that beginning. And we didn't choose it. It was just there. And so, that first period, we want to go back and we want to start looking at Luther now. Now, what has God been doing? For ages, He's been preparing the world. And now we want to see how He prepared Luther. <laughs> because Luther had to have something in him before he could do Reformation. See? And the thing that he had to have in him was the whole proper, the whole way of dealing with the Reformation in his own life. See? Now, I'm going to back away from this for just a minute because there's something going on in our church right now that we haven't seen for a while. For example, for the next few days, for the next week, the General Conference has seven speakers that have been invited by the General Conference President. He's going to be the seventh speaker. And their subject is going to be, how do we get reformed? <laughs> Revival they're talking about. Now, I am really hoping they're going to get there. I really hope they understand the real problems in our midst. 
Well, I don't want to say too much. We're on this thing. But there are several things I'm looking for. Key things that must be there. And I hope that some of our leaders understand what those issues really are because we can talk revival for a thousand years and, and it won't happen if we don't do what God says His way. Now, we're going to look at Luther because he did it God's way. And we see the power in what happened. So, if we are going to understand Reformation, we have to see it in Luther's life first. And then we'll see how God took that life and used that process for Christianity. <laughs> so it's very important that we understand what we're doing here. We want to see the Reformation in Luther. So we have to begin with his parents. <laughs> okay. The name Luther was an old name. And as families went from family to family, the trend, of course, in those days was for the oldest son to inherit the home and the land. And the other children were to move away and make their own life. Well, John Luther was not the eldest son, so he had to move away. <laughs> Okay, He had to find a new life. And he married a lady by the name of Margaret, Margaret Lindemann. And uh, they went to settle in a little town called Eisleben. And they had to start earning their living somehow. Now, you just think about that for a minute. You're not the eldest son. It's time for you to start your own life. And what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Leave home. <laughs> and nobody's going to pay your way. <laughs> what do you do? You start looking in the papers. <laughs> Where do you find money? Work. <laughs> well, that was their way of life. And the first thing they knew is, I'm going to be poor. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't tell you this in the history books but we have to put ourselves in the situation and say well what would I do in that setting what would happen and you realize suddenly man I'm out on the streets <laughs> well so here we're looking at John and Margaret they're, they're going to try to make their way now now, one of the things that John had, he was part of the age, and, and the age was moving towards learning. And he picked that up. And he liked books. He liked to read books. And they were very hard to get a hold of. They were very rare in those days. But any time he could find a book, he'd get one, and he would read and he had a serious bent to his mind. He wanted to learn. He was poor. <laughs> he didn't have a future. But he wanted to learn. Okay? And so he read as much as he could. Now, we know about some of the laws of heredity. That's why I'm getting into that a little bit. We're talking about Luther, not John. <laughs> but we have to go through John to get to him. And so he had a father that this way, and he was a very serious man. He was a very stern man. In those days, they were taught by the church, if you don't beat your child, they're going to turn out to be rotten. <laughs> so beating children was part of family life. And Luther, when he comes along, he received his share. <laughs> and his mother was stern, although she was softer. She was still stern, too. One time she beat him so bad, he, the blood came. <laughs> now, they were loving, but this is the way the church taught them. Okay? They loved Luther, but they didn't want to ruin him. We're going to look at that in just a little bit. 
Luther was known to be a good man. I'm talking about John Luther. He was a good man. He was a solid man. He was a serious man. He was a real hard worker. <laughs> now, his wife was also known. She had a prayerful spirit. And all the women took her to be an example of what a Christian is supposed to be like. So, these are the parents of Luther. On the 10th of November, 1483, that day it was in dispute a long time. Melanchthon could never figure out when Luther was born because when he asked the mother, the mother would say, I don't know what year. <laughs> but the, the children and the family figured it out. James, his brother, said he was born in 1483. So we take that as a good date. Okay. And Luther himself. It was discovered that in one of his uh, Hebrew Psalters, he wrote in there, I was born in 1483, so I think that's pretty good. We have that pretty solid, even though the history books aren't too sure. I think it's clear. Now, November the 10th, what, did, did I give you that date, the 10th? Or did, because the 11th is the important date. He was born on the 10th, but that was St. Martin's Eve. See? And St. Martin's day was the 11th, the next day, his first full day of life. Okay? He was born one hour before midnight. <laughs> now, because he was born on St. Martin's Eve, they named him Martin. That's how he got his name. Okay? So now, we know who Martin Luther is. And on Tuesday, the next day, on the 11th, they took him to the church and they had him sprinkled. And now he's a Christian. <laughs> okay, so we're starting to uh, to get a little bit of background here. When he was six months old, they moved. They moved to Mansfeld. It was a place where they had mines. And of course, since they had mines, people could earn a living there. And uh, he figured, I can do better for my family. For some reason, John got the idea, I'm going to end up with a big family. I have to find some way to support him. <laughs> so they went to Mansfield, Mansfield and uh, started looking around for something to do. And what did he know? What could he do? There were trees. He started cutting them down. <laughs> he became a woodcutter. <laughs> Okay? Now, that's how things were back then. You look around us for something to do. <laughs> well, he wasn't the only woodcutter in the family. His wife was out there working with him, too. Here they are hauling this wood. And we might even imagine seeing little old Martin carrying his little piece of wood <laughs> when he got old enough. Okay? So this is how the family lived. And they were in extreme poverty. It was all they could do to get enough money to get some food. So this is the first thing we want to know about Luther. This is his life. A woodcutter who likes to read. A good woman for a, a mother. And they're just in survival mode. And he gets beat up all the time because that's who he was. He was just a kind of a kid who was always doing something to get beat up. <laughs> he was always into something. <laughs> so here they are, this poor little family. Now I hope you can get a hold of that because we're talking about the man who changed the world. <laughs> that's who God picked. That's who God trained. <laughs> That's who God used. This little family stuck out of nowhere. <laughs> Living in poverty. Well, Dobigny makes an interesting comment that I think I better get into here. It says, the example of the parents whom he revered, the habits they inspired in him, 
early accustomed Luther to labor and frugality. Hard work and economy. Don't throw away your money. Don't waste it on things that aren't life-supporting. Mm -hmm. This is the man that God used. And if you go back and read history, these are the kind of people he always uses. You think about Alan and James White sometime and think how they started out. Yeah, when they started their family, they had no money. She built chairs out of barrels. <laughs> they bought a table for 25 cents. <laughs> they hardly knew where their next meal was coming from. And all he could think about was putting papers together and get them set out in the mail and he used his money for God's work instead of food. Now that's not our subject today. But we're talking about God, how He does things, and the kind of people He uses. God has no use in His work for self-indulgent people. Are you getting the message? It's right here. We've just got a little blaze in the Luther's life. <laughs> and already we're getting a message. Oh, I want to talk about what's happening in our church right now, but I'm afraid to say too much. Do you know who's going to finish the work? Do you know who's going to be first out there to get it done? It's going to be the Africans. It's going to be the Chinese. It's going to be the Now, my prophet's license has not been punched lately, but I want you to look and you wait and you see how God does it. He is not going to do it with Americans. We are too rich. We know nothing about suffering mm -hmm. yet. Not yet. We will. <laughs> yet. He's going to save Americans too, but he's going to put this country in a place we haven't even thought about, and we're going to learn what it means mm -hmm. to wonder where your next meal is coming from. Right. Yeah, we have money in the bank. Yeah, we have things to drive. Yeah, we have everything Americans have. Well, Seventh-day Adventists aren't going to stay that way. Okay? Don't get used to it. <laughs> we're looking at history of how God works. Luther is poor and he knows don't waste your money on knickknacks. <laughs> Isaiah 55, why spend your money for that which is not food? Doesn't it say that? Yeah, you can read it sometimes. The Bible is not out of date. All right, continuing. Continuing. Luther's parents we're working hard, and Luther was learning how to work. Finally, John put enough money together to buy two furnaces. And he got into the mining business slowly, a little bit at a time. And he was making a little bit more money. Now he could feed his family. But it was still a lot of work. It's still poverty as far as, you know, he didn't have a savings account. <laughs> he had to keep working, working, working. Um, now the people noticed what kind of a person he was. So they said, you know, we need you to, to help us organize our community. And so he got into, we would say, politics. Very primitive kind, but still he was helping the people. And he got into a position where they really respected him. He was helping the community. And he liked that. And he said, you know, maybe I can take another step. We have food to eat now. We'll take the next step. 
we'll start having people in. We'll feed them too. <laughs> and so he started inviting the people around, the leaders of the community. And those leaders would come into the house and little Martin Luther would listen to them talking. <laughs> and they would talk about interesting things. And he thought, you know, maybe I could be one of those. <laughs> Maybe I could have an education. Maybe. <laughs> and so little by little this was developing. And his father noticed this. That his son really had an interest. And he was smart. So he decided he was going to send him to school. And so they would take him. And the, uh, we don't have good historical records to tell us exactly when it started, but he must have been very young because the father or his one of the other people around there would carry Martin Luther to school every day and then carry him back home. <laughs> so he must have really been a young child. <laughs> and so that was his first taste. And of course, the, one of the first things he tasted was the teacher whipping him because he was getting in trouble at school, too. <laughs> and they'd, they'd let him have it. The, there's a record of in one day, they let him have it 15 times. <laughs> yeah. That was life back then. And of course, poor, poor little Martin, that's all he knew. That's all he knew. If you were going to get an education, the, the teacher had to scare you into it. <laughs> and the teacher had to beat you into it. <laughs> and the teacher had to keep you motivated. <laughs> so here he is, starting to learn. Now we're talking still about little Martin Luther. This is all he knows, his life of poverty and getting beat up. <laughs> His father used to kneel at night and pray with him before he'd go to sleep. And Daubigny tells us, I don't know what his source was for this exactly, I haven't found it, but he's, Daubigny is a tremendous historian. He says the father would pray aloud begging the Lord that his son might remember his name, God's name. And one day, the boy would contribute to the propagation of the truth. <laughs> A father prayed for his son that way. Did he get an answer? <laughs> yeah, it's important that we pray. For our children, it's important that we pray for each other. We don't know where those prayers are going. I'm sure that John had absolutely no idea, never entered his head what he was praying about and how God was going to answer that. <laughs> well, he was going to school. And he was learning about religion in the school, too. Every time Jesus' name was mentioned, Martin Luther shook. <laughs> it struck nothing but fear in him. <laughs> because religion was where he was getting his beatings from. <laughs> so that's all he knew about Jesus Christ. And, of course, God is going to use that, too, you know. You, you think about it as his life is progressing, what's happening. All he knows is fearing God. And that's not a bad thing. We all need to fear God. I know what the ministers say. They say, oh, that means reverence. I'm sorry, that's not right. The Bible does not mean reverence to God you know, you get on your high horse and say, I'm going to do God a favor by revering him. <laughs> fear means fear. A true fear of understanding who you're dealing with. This is not a game. This is God. Sovereign. 
of it. Mighty God! The highest we can ever know. And Luther got that. <laughs> now he learned that that fear can turn in the right direction and you can fear and love God at the same time. See? But you don't learn to really love Him until you fear Him. Okay? I've never said that in a meeting. That's one of our problems today. There are people in our church calling God Daddy. Come on. Come on. <laughs> So anyhow, we're moving through a lot of things here. I'm trying to keep the historical perspective, but I have to throw in a few things so we see what the history teaches us. Luther was learning something else. I don't know if any of us have learned that one. That flogging that he was getting taught him not to seek sensual pleasures. Do you understand that? Yeah. It was disciplining his mind to not even go in that direction. Sensual pleasures. The floggings were taking it out of him. At school, he was learning, of course, the catechism. And interestingly enough, they taught him the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, a few hymns, some prayers. But the important thing was he was learning Latin. He was learning Latin. And he learned it from books written by St. Jerome's master. So that's pretty high. Uh, he learned everything that could teach him. And then he was past that school. Now what? <laughs> you see, that happens. You can learn more than your teachers know how to teach. <laughs> well, he got there. He learned everything they could teach him. And he knew there was more. So John Luther thought about that. He says, you know, he really has an aptitude for this. He, he likes learning. He gobbles it up. We, uh, we have to find another place for him. And so, when Martin reached the age of 14, it's off to the next school. <laughs> His father sent him to a Franciscan school at Magdeburg. And of course, once he left home, he'd never been away from home. He's discovering a whole new life out there. Even more poverty than he had already known. <laughs> because his father did not send him with an allowance. He sent him to school and figured they would teach him. And in the process of teaching him, they'd feed him. But there was no such thing. They said, if you want to eat, you go find your food. <laughs> And so they taught him more poverty. And Martin Luther learned how to beg for his bread. He went wandering around with some other fellows, little other students, from house to house, begging food so they could eat. But it's, it's, it's at this point that I learned something I didn't know about Luther. The fellows that he were with could sing, and he could sing. And so they would go to the houses. And at the Christmas season, they would go around singing and begging for food. And they did better then because they were singing hymns and carols and things. <laughs> and he was an alto. <laughs> and he had a beautiful voice. Do you think about that when you think Martin Luther? <laughs> a beautiful 
alto voice and this young child, 14 years old. And they sang four-part harmonies. And they'd go around and the people enjoyed that. So they were able to, to get some food. So we're learning more about Martin Luther. He learned to love music. He was a musician. He learned how to play the lute. He learned how to play the flute. <laughs> he was a musician. <laughs> and he loved music. So we're starting to pick up a little bit more about this, this man. He's a little still a boy here. He had just been there a year and his parents found out what a terrible time he was having just finding food to eat. So they said, well, you can't stay there. You'll starve. So they sent him to another school at Eisenach. And this was a celebrated school. This is a really good school. But they sent him there because there were relatives of the family there. And they figured, well, he can't get in real bad trouble. They'll feed him. Well, when Luther got there, he found out the relatives were as poor as his parents, and they didn't feed him either. <laughs> so it's back to begging. <laughs> so here he is, 14 years old, begging for his food. Now, can you remember when you were 14? What were you thinking about when you were 14? Were you thinking about... Well, what am I going to do in life? What's, what's going to happen? I can't stay with my parents forever. What can I do? <laughs> what can I learn? <laughs> and look, they must have been doing the same thing. And here he is begging for a living. <laughs> and he thought, well, I can't do this forever. I can't beg for my food forever. <laughs> so I may have to go back to my father's place and help him with the mines. And that's that. No more education. I have to give up with school. And so he was thinking about the future and it looked pretty dim and bad. Oh. What could I hope for? Well, he had just been bad-mouthed at three homes. <laughs> and he says, well... I guess I better go back to the school. No food today. And he was standing there thinking about it. And a woman came out of her house. And she said, come over here. So he went over there. And she said, uh, I heard you singing. I'd like to hear you sing some more. So he sang with the, the, his, the other fellows, and it was beautiful. And she, she really, she commented on his voice. What a, what a fantastic singing voice you have. So she gave them some food. Uh, her name was Ursula. She was famous in that town. They called her the pious Shunammite. Because she was always helping somebody. <laughs> yeah, she was famous. And she was married to a rich man. His name was Kota. C-O-T-T-A. And so she invited these singers in and she gave them some food. And she said, well, come back. So they came back the next day and she gave them some food some more. And the, the husband started talking to Martin. And he thought, well, this is a, an unusual fellow here. And he liked his voice. He says, he said, why, don't, why don't you come live with us? <laughs> he said, <"What?" laughs> Yeah. He said, you can stay here. You got a school. We'll take care of you. You can stay with us. and uh, We'll enjoy your company. We can talk. And he said, oh, okay. <laughs> and so from that moment, his life changed. The very day he was saying, Oh, the rest of my life I'm done, a beggar, <laughs> or back to my father. <laughs> you see? Way down. And 
then God opens the door. <laughs> and Luther had something put in him in that day. I was talking to Laurie about it this morning. There are times in our life when God does something we didn't expect especially under certain circumstances we weren't looking for anything. Mm -hmm. And something happens and lights turn on. And we see something we hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. We understand something about God we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We understand something about our relationship, how it is between Him and us, the love He has and how He does things. And it is so real. It is such a fact of your life you never forget it. It's you for the rest of your life. You know that happened and it's just not a one-time thing. See? This is part of where I hope our church is being steered by leadership today. Our church does not have the experience of that moment with God where you know He's done something and you can never forget it. We're too busy being scholars. Yeah. We're too busy being theologians. We're being preached at all the time instead of taught the principles of the gospel. Yes. We have a chance to turn this around, even beginning now under the leadership we have. But something has to change to get us to that place where we can experience Experience something with God. Luther, I'm sure, had one of those experiences when I thought I was gone the rest of my life and here I am in this home. <laughs> Look what God did. He's taking care of me. <laughs> you know, he had to have that as a reality in his life. When the Pope came after him, he could say, Jesus is taking care of me. <laughs> See? That's where, where this comes from. That epiphany, that, that fantastic awakening of that thought, that reality. Okay, so here we are. He's now 14 years old and his life has changed. And now he eats every day. <laughs> and now he can think about something else besides survival. Now he can begin thinking about his studies. He can begin thinking about the arts. He can begin thinking about music. He can become a living person who's now starting to understand what the word joy might mean. <laughs> joy! Joy! He's learning new things. His nature is being shifted around here. He's learning how not to be afraid of everything. Now he's starting to learn how to settle down and be serene. He never had that before. He's, he's learning a new thing. It was in him as part of his nature. He, he was learning how to express Cheerfulness. <laughs> yeah. Serene, cheerful, joy. And he knows happiness. <laughs> and you know it's got to mean something to a person who's been in abject poverty and getting beat up all the time to all of a sudden have this. <laughs> His thirst for knowledge increased. <laughs> and this man who has talents he knows nothing about, capacities, this genius is all of a sudden starting to awaken. <laughs> you know, Luther loved music. Have you ever heard the song, A Mighty Fortress? <laughs> that came out of Luther. 
<laughs> he composed that, the, the music and the words. There are many German hymns that he <laughs> composed. He was a musician. <laughs> Sometime maybe we should talk about hymns and their contribution to Christianity. It's a fantastic thing that hymns do. Well, God gave him hymns. Things for the people to sing about to understand God. And you know they have to be good ones because they're in English now. <laughs> and so Luther now, this young Luther is a happy Luther. <laughs> He's got a new life. Things are happening now that he didn't know about before. Now, he, he said something that I don't know is in many history books. I want to read it to you. Because this came out of Martin Luther. I don't want you to ever think of him as a stern person like his father. Luther was different. He needed what his father contributed. He needed that part, but Luther was different. Here's what he said. There is nothing sweeter on earth than a, the heart of a woman in which piety dwells. <laughs> yeah, what a thought. Luther, that's who he was. Now, later when he becomes the celebrated doctor who the whole world is listening to. He never forgot that life of poverty. He learned something there. You don't learn another way. He never forgot it. When the son of this woman and this man, Kota, Conrad Kota, came to Wittenberg, Luther invited him to his home and he fed him and he took care of him. He remembered what it was like to be in poverty and he always said, please don't despise these children that come begging at your house for bread. You help them. That, there's nothing wrong with that. They need to eat. <laughs> okay. So he always remembered where he came from. He wanted to teach a lesson to the people that he talked to that way. Because it's what he learned. God alone should receive the glory from anything we receive, even that child begging some food. Yeah. God alone gets the glory, and that's how he lived his life. Now, there's one thing we learn from what happened at school. He had three particular strengths that began to bud. His understanding, he knew what was being taught. He could pick it up. He could work with it. He knew where it went. He had strength of understanding. And then he had a fantastic memory. <laughs> he just did not forget the things he learned. They were right there. And the third thing is the liveliness of his imagination. <laughs> He could put these things places. <laughs> I want to say some things about that, but I'm going to leave that alone for now. Maybe we'll come back. He, he made rapid progress in all of his schooling, and it became apparent right away that he passed all the students. He just went, <laughs> he just ate it up. <laughs> and the students loved him. He just was a, a good fellow. <laughs> and the teachers loved him. But there was one teacher in particular that he attached himself to. His name was John Trebonius. He was a really good teacher, but Trebonius did something none of the other teachers did. When he would come into the class, Trebonius would take off his hat and salute the students. <laughs> no, all the other teachers beat up on him, but he took off his hat. <laughs> and they really did reach Luther. Why did Trebonius do that? 
Tony has done it. Well, we, we have it recorded in history. He said, when the other teachers would ask him, why do you do that kind of stuff? He says, well, there, there are among us, among these boys, men that will one day become burgomasters, doctors, chancellors, magistrates. We should respect them. <laughs> Tremendous! And of course, Luther was in his class. <laughs> okay. I'm going to move on a little bit. I didn't think I'd cover that much ground that quickly. It's okay. We'll, we'll do a little bit more today. He's... Uh, now 18 years old, he has tasted it, the better life. He has tasted literature. He studied the old, ancient, brilliant people, the philosophers, the poets. He's getting all of this inside. This is becoming part of him. By the way, that is, that is the clue to real learning. Don't read something and memorize it and say, I have it now. No. Get it inside of you and say, how would I have written that? How would I work with it? How does it become part of me? See? That's the only way you can really be educated properly. Just, just going to school and doing what the teachers tell you is nothing. If you're going to be a person, get the best you can find wherever you can find it and make it part of yourself. And that includes the Bible. Don't just read about Paul. Become Paul. Yeah. You get on the road to Damascus and you get knocked down by the light and you hear the voice and when he says, I'm Jesus, you know I'm dead. <laughs> And you feel it inside. I have offended God. <laughs> and then you sense what He does. He fills your life with His Spirit and makes you a disciple to the Gentiles. Yeah, that's you. That's your life. Don't think it just happened to Paul. Then go over to Peter and do the same thing. All of God's people in the Bible become each one of them. <laughs> Ellen White, do it with Ellen White. Yeah. Do it with Loughborough. Find out as much as you can about people to see how did God work in that life. And then become that life. Get it. Feel it. Work with it. No, that's part of me now. Yeah. That's what Luther did. That was part of his power. <laughs> he was 18 years old, but he already <laughs> was becoming this giant. <laughs> yeah. He didn't know it. Well, he knew he had to have more. He knew he had to have more. And his father said, okay, we're going to have to start sending you some money because you can't do anymore without money and I have enough to eat now. We have a little extra. Go. Go to school. Go to school. Go to the university. The big place. We're going to turn you into a lawyer. <laughs> yes. Yes. I have a certain standing here in the community, but you're going to be a lawyer. <laughs> and Luther said, okay, I'm going to school. <laughs> so in 1501, he went to Eisenach. And what did he get for an education? The scholastic education of the time. Nothing worthwhile. 
<laughs> dealing with problems, showing that your mind was so sharp, you could handle that problem and work it out. You could handle that problem and work it out. That was education back then. And that's what they did to Luther. That's an amazing thing. He needed that. He needed that. I can tell you a little bit about it because the Lord, for some reason, put me in a class at the seminary. I had no idea why I was in the class. It was called metaethics. And I could care less about metaethics. Why should I be in this class? But the Lord put me there. So I said, okay. You have to get the grade point if you're at that seminary. You have to get the grade point. So you, you go for it. Well, I found out years later why the Lord put me in that class. Because metaethics is the study of the ideas behind the ideas. In other words, Immanuel Kant writes his philosophy and you read the philosophy. Now, in metaethics, you are told, destroy his philosophy. Destroy Immanuel Kant? Wasn't he a brilliant philosopher? <laughs> yes. Destroy his philosophy. <laughs> How do you do that? What was he thinking about to come up with this thought? And does it work if you continue it? Let me tell you, that is a mind stretcher to go through that kind of a process because they didn't get, just give you one philosopher. As soon as you got done with that one for that week, now we're going to do this one and this one and this one. And you have to destroy all of them. And once you learn how to do that, you can't read a book without destroying it in the first few sentences and say, this man's thinking is not right. <laughs> And Luther was learning that ability to go to ideas and instantly know that doesn't go anywhere. God was preparing him to face the Pope, <laughs> the whole Catholic Church. It's an amazing thing what God does. Now, when he sent him to the scholastics, you know what God was doing. He was teaching him to meet any kind of an idea and see right away the falseness of how you get there. And he learned that. But Melanchthon said it's too bad that he went there. Melanchthon did not understand how God does everything. See? Melanchthon is very sharp, but he missed one little thing. Luther needed that. Melanchthon thought if he had had teachers that could have taught him proper religion, then that would have done something to Luther's violent nature. <laughs> Melanchthon knew about his violent nature! <laughs> but Luther needed that violent nature under certain circumstances. See? He was a man under discipline. It wasn't undisciplined. But he had a violent nature. He could take things. And he knew how to get back. <laughs> okay. We'll try to read some of this later. We will recognize these things as we get into his dealings with the whole church. That's another subject. We're just dealing with his background. The, the beginning Luther. Who he, beca who he was becoming as he was growing. Um, he studied through them all the masterpieces of antiquity. He was conversing with Cicero, Virgil, all the classic authors. And he just didn't read them. Remember, if you've never read Virgil or Cicero or Homer or any of those, you don't know there's a certain spirit in those writings. These men were giants. They were real thinkers. 
none of this Mickey Mouse stuff of today. Real, solid thinkers. And Luther, when he would read them, he would make those thoughts his own. See? He imbibed in those thoughts. They were now part of him. And he could draw from them. Oh, we'll see some amazing things when we see him dealing with people with the Scriptures once he got the Scriptures. See, he knows nothing about the Bible up until now. He doesn't even know there's a Bible. He's never seen one. He's never heard one. <laughs> He's a pagan. But God is building this heaven. <laughs> this is an amazing thing. Well, the university immediately saw who this was, and they admired this genius. I said, oh, who is like this one? He just eats everything up. He can't get it out. <laughs> He's 18 years old. <laughs> he would pray. He'd go to church, he'd study, but he wasn't a Christian yet. He didn't know what a Christian was. He just knew what the church said. He wasn't getting it. He had been there for two years, and when he was 20 years old, he was in the library, as usual. <laughs> and he found a book. He said, well, I haven't seen this book before. What is this book? He said, Bible. <laughs> he said, Bible? What's Bible? <laughs> and he can't believe that what he's reading. Samuel, the story of David. What is this? <laughs> he said, I never knew there was this kind of a book. He found the, the Gospels. He says, well, there's, there's part of the story I heard a priest say one time. I thought those stories they're told was all there was. Look at this! <laughs> and he began reading and looking at it, and he could not believe it. He says, so many pages! <laughs> and he started reading and reading. Oh, And he cannot believe God has given us a book. Of course, he doesn't know yet all the corruptions through Jerome and all that that are in there. But there's enough in there he sees. There's a lot more to this than I ever knew about. And he began to see it. All this history. All this revelation. Oh, oh, if I could have a book like this <laughs> for myself. <laughs> of course, that Bible was in Latin. It had all kinds of error in it. It was a Catholic Bible. By the way, the apostate Protestant churches of today say, don't read the King James because it's full of errors and it's too old, the language is bad. You have to read the good modern Bibles. Mm -hmm. After all, wasn't Luther converted by a Latin Bible? That's what they say, see? Mm -hmm. That's one of their basic arguments. He was converted by the Catholic Bible. I'm sorry, they're wrong. They're wrong. Mm -hmm. And even our men who say it, they're wrong. If that was a good Bible and Luther later on believed it was a good Bible, if it was really the Word of God, he never would have translated one into the language of the people and not used the Latin version at all. He used Erasmus 
Greek version for the New Testament. Yes. Oh, these bad arguments. I'm sorry. There's no room for some of these bad arguments that the apostates are using and even some of our own men not taken up. I'm sorry. But he got enough. He got enough. It got him moving. It got him reading. We'll get to later when he read in the Greek and the Hebrew the real thing. Yeah, we'll get to that. But that's not here. He's only 20 years old here. <laughs> okay? He became a bachelor. 20 years old. <laughs> a bachelor. He's on his way to becoming a lawyer. <laughs> And then he studied to pass his examinations. And he studied so hard and spent so much time with it and really went after it that he became ill and he almost died. Everybody thought he was going to die right there. He, he got skinny. He was bones. He couldn't recover. They thought death was right there. And they thought, what a pity. Look at all of this capacity. Look at all of this ability. Look at what he could be. And now he's going to die. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine our world today? A dead 20-year-old Martin Luther. <laughs> And, uh, a priest came to him while he was laying there. 20-year-old Martin Luther, he says, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm dead, that's it. A priest came to him. He says, well now, he said, don't you know that God chastens those whom he loves? <laughs> and he says, What? <laughs> turned him around. <laughs> he said, God loves me. He's not letting me die. He loves me. And he remembered some Bible things. And the doctor said, you know, as Samuel was dedicated to the Lord, your mother dedicated you to the Lord. There's something for you to do yet. <laughs> Yeah, something for you to do. What a prediction. There's something for you to do. <laughs> and so Luther recovered. He now knew there was a Bible. He'd been brought back from death. The priest said something about God that was true for him. Maybe I shouldn't start this. I'll just say this much. It was Easter time and Luther wanted to go back home to see his, his parents. He was now a bachelor. He's alive. <laughs> and everybody wore swords in those days. Everybody. Everybody. And he was doing something. I don't know what he was doing, but he was such an impetuous person. Who knows what he was up to? <laughs> and he, he kicked his sword and it fell out of the scabbard and, <clears throat> and cut an artery. <laughs> and he was with some friends and they tried to stop it. And they couldn't stop it. He put his finger in it. He couldn't stop it. That was it. He was going to bleed to death now. So they went running off to find somebody to help him. And while he was laying there, he said, Oh, Mary, help me! <laughs> Superstitious Martin Luther! <laughs> Mary, help me! <sighs> and then he fainted. He lost so much blood. They brought a physician, sewed him up, so he, we know he didn't die. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Years later, he said, you know, I should have died relying upon Mary. <laughs> he finally figured it out. <laughs> I should have died. <laughs> well, at his celebration party, they made a big, big deal out of him being this graduate of this fantastic university that Erfurt, and they had a big party afterwards, and they made a big deal about him. And he was thinking about that. He said, well, I'm going to go on. I'm going to go take my law degree. <laughs> he said, I'll do what my father wants me to do. So let's leave Luther there for right now. Luther is now recovering from his death wound of the artery. <laughs> he's 20 years old. He's a big shot. He's got his bachelor's. <laughs> he's now going to go on to study law diligently and be a brilliant lawyer. <laughs> we'll take him from there next time. Okay, let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you that you're totally in control. It doesn't always feel good to us, but you're blessing us. You're building us, and you don't make mistakes. You know exactly where you're taking us because you already see us as the finished product. That's what you're looking at. You see us in eternity a billion years from now. Help us to catch a taste of that, to know that in Jesus' hands it's all perfect, it's all done. We need to cooperate. Help us somehow to catch this vision that Luther received, that in the hands of God everything is okay. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.